mentioned the why the three species, Shorkes Vays, were chosen to be the species. So the Vedrish had said, because Elokim Vakish Nirdov, because since these three species are pursued by the lion, by the wolf, and by the leopard, or the mountain lion, therefore Hashem chose these species. Because they are Nirdofim and Elokim Vakish Nirdov. And Elokim seeks out the pursuit. We've made a point. Elohim is the appellation of Midas Adin. That even Midas Adin favors the pursuit. And we explained why. But to explain it at another, a little bit more clear, that when we speak of Midas Adin, why could you not be perfect enough? Because nobody's perfect. But what about we explain why does Hashem favor the pursuit? Because a person, when he's in that state of pursuit where he realizes he has nowhere to turn and he internalizes the reality that his whole existence is based on God willing whether he exists or not exists, that level of connection, you actually, you lose your identity. I am not me. Whatever I am, it's only because God wills my being. The moment you attach yourself at that level, you become subsumed. You take on God's, God's persona, so to say. You don't have an independent identity. That's why Elohim, Ivakish Nirdov, even Elohim, because the Nirdov, when he reaches that level, he's totally negated himself to Hashem, so there's no basis for prosecution any longer. Because the person has given up his identity. My identity is Hashem. Okay? Now, the Rabbeinu Yonet said in, in the... Shari Tshuva, based on the Pesach and Tehillim, the whole concept of, of Rachmim, of Tshuva, of forgiveness reinstatement is Rachmim. As the Medjur says, whenever it says Korban, it's always Korban Lashem. You'll never find the, the appellation Elohim by Korban, only Yudke Vavke. The whole concept of bringing a Korban and atoning is only within the context of Midas HaRachmim. It's not with Midas Adin. We explain, well, why did Hashem take these species and bring them for me as the Korban? Because they themselves are pursued species. And we explain, we ask the question, the species is an unintelligible creature. What does that do with the person? So we explain, based on the Ramban, that when you bring that Korban, what's supposed to be the thought process of the person? That in truth, based on Midas Adin, what should be? I should have been slaughtered, my blood, blood should have been sprinkled, and I should have been burnt. It was only due to Rachmi Hashem, the God's mercy, that he's willing to take this in my stead. That's, that's, that's the mindset. So therefore, the species you bring, or the animal you bring, is in your stead, because this should have happened to you, except the Rachmi Hashem, Korban Hashem says, I'm willing to accept that in your place. And if you remember, we've mentioned the name of Orachim HaKodesh. If the world was created based on Mishpat, if you fail, what are you taking the life of the Korban? She so explains that the Gemara tells us that when a person sins, personally sins because he's not fully stable, there's a certain degree of instability, lack of clarity. That's why you, you sin. So that when the person sins, the action is, is associated with the action of a behemoth, of an animal, unintelligible creature. When the person, a carbon has to be predicated on vidu. You have to confess to tshuva. When you do tshuva, that, what is the meaning of tshuva? You've come to the recognition of who you should have been and who you want to be. Once you come to that level, so who are you today? You're an Odom. So to take the life of an Odom for the behavior of a behema, that's not within the context of mishpat. That's not equitable justice. Therefore, Hashem says, we take the species, the animal, for the animal action, which was done by the person who's come to recognition that he's the Odom. That's why the animal takes the place of the person. That's, that's the Midas Arachmin, within Nishwat. It's unfair that the Odom should be taken for the behavior of Behemo. So, but nevertheless, but you're the one, you're the perpetrator. That is Rachmin. But it's within the context of Mishpat. Now, even though Korban is Rachmim, but Hashem says, you know what species I want? I want the species of pursued species. You know why? 
course, Elohim Yivakish Neder. Of course, even the Midas Adin is in, in agreement that since that represents the total negation of the person to Hashem, that everything's him, that's why it's Rachmim within the context of Midas Adin. That even Midas Adin will be agreeable that this Rachmim should be able to go through. And he lets it pass. After Hashem had wiped out the camp of Satcherev, which were millions of troops came to destroy Yushalayim, Gavriel wiped them out at midnight in one swoop. Chizkyo Melch Yehuda was the king of Yehuda. Hashem says, Satcherev should be Gogu Mogog, and Chizkyo Melch Yehuda should be Mashiach. And we've come to the end of time. The Midas then came and said, but I don't think it's 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 appropriate because Chizkyo Melchud didn't say Halil. He should have said Halil. And because he didn't say Halil, therefore he's not worthy of being Mashiach. And Hashem agreed. Based on Midas Adin, Midas Arachmim, he could be he could be Mashiach. But Midas Adin said he's not where he, he, he should be more perfect. And since he didn't say Halil, he doesn't qualify. Hashem, if that's the case, we'll bring Mashiach on hold. Chizkyo Melchud will not be Mashiach. So you see that even within we're holding there, Midas Arachim says he should. Sadcher should be Gogomogo. But because it's not perfect enough, it doesn't happen. The Korban, Hashem wants the reinstatement of every Jew when he brings the Korban. Therefore, the, con the concept is Midas Arachim. Hashem is giving you another chance to be reinstated. But the species that you bring is a representation of the Nirdaf, which even the Midas Adin is an agreement that the person, because he has such a degree of, of negation and giving up his identity to the will of Hashem, therefore, even the Misr Din doesn't come and prosecute and lets it go through and lets the person be reinstated. It's interesting, the um, a Shalom Kodesh writes that the mitzvah of the conjugal obligation that a person has to his wife is when the woman comes back from the mikvah and the on Shabbos, Leil Shabbos. See, it says why. What's the reason? She explains a man is naturally attracted to a woman, a man's to and the woman to a man. A person who keeps family purity despite temptation. A person restrains himself and does not engage with his wife. Why? Because that's what Hashem has said. That each person is not permitted to the other and they keep their distance during this period of time. After the woman comes, goes to the mikvah, now she's permitted. Whenever conception is about to take place, there are many types of souls that could go into that child. And how it goes. What's going to be the destiny of that child? Satan is always makatrig. Satan always prosecutes. And he wants somehow to handicap that soul. Because the objective of the soul coming into his existence is what? Is for its spiritual mission. Satan wants at the initial, at the time of conception, that soul should be handicapped. And should have limitations. Should not be able to function fully in its capacity. So by... Going to the mikvah, the night, the uh, conjugal occasion, the night of the mikvah, Hashem says, Mida connected Mida. That since this person did not succumb to temptation, which is you, you have no right to tamper with that soul. That soul will be that perfect soul, unhindered to be able to maximize on its potential. This is the Shalom Kodesh. So we see a similar idea that since you put yourself in a position to be willing, to restrain yourself, despite human nature, it's to have temptation and to engage, and despite that you did not, therefore Hashem will keep Satan at bay that he can't prosecute. That he's not able, because the basis from tampering is prosecution, because nobody's perfect. So because in that moment, you did behave based solely on Hashem's will, he does not let the Satan to tamper with that neshama. Same thing, Shabbos is May Shabbos is has semblance of the world to come. 
which suddenly has no relevance to that state of Kedusha, therefore, again, the likelihood or the ability to bring about whatever it can interfere and damage, Shabbos night, it has less ability to bring that about. That's the Shalom Kodesh. But it's a similar concept. I remember I used to meet every once in a while with a certain person who's a professed atheist. Professed atheist. And he, he it's public knowledge. Himself, he's been written up in the paper. He backed uh he backs birthright till today. And I once asked him a question. We once sparred for about two hours. The first time I met him. And he I said to him, I want to ask you a question. You claim you don't believe in God. I said, if you'd be in, in, and he was raised, he had a bar mitzvah. And he was given a pair of tefillin at his time of his bar mitzvah. And um, I said, if you'd be in a foxhole and the bombs are falling, and you had, a, I said the word, a safer tailing, those are the words I said to him. Would you, say, would you pray from that, from that Psalms, from that tailing? He says, definitely, not a question. I said, if you don't believe in God, what are you, what are you wasting your time? So he says to me, he's a smart guy. He says, what do I have to lose? What do I have to lose? So I pray. I said, if you saved after after fact, you come out of the fox alive, would you attribute it to God? He says, no. Because he needs empirical evidence that God saved him. On one side, what do I have to lose? Might as well pray. Because if there's a God, maybe he'll save me. But when I come out, it has to be proven without question. I need that evidence there is. Until then, I don't accept it. So he played two sides of the equation over here. So I'm saying, when the atheist in the foxhole, you're there, you're right. But let's say the moment you get out of that foxhole, you're back to where you were. At that moment, there's no prosecution on it. But if, unless you, it holds, then you're the old same son of a gun. My father used to tell over a joke. This person was fleeing from the enemy. And he comes where there was a bridge that spanned a ravine. And he realizes that he can't cross. So he takes a long log that spans the two sides of the ravine. And he realizes when he walks across this log, he has to go real slow. Because any slight movement, he falls thousand feet and he dies so before he gets on the log he makes a commitment ten thousand dollars to stoken makes a commitment so he's going inching his way slowly across the log and as he gets to the second side and he's about to put his foot on the second side he thinks to himself you know ten thousand dollars is a lot of money no maybe i should reconsider the moment he has that thought the log is a jolt he nearly falls he says Hashem, I'm only joking. Give me a break. I'm just joking. You understand? And that's the way people are. When you're in the foxhole, you'll make the commitment to this and this. Once it passes, obviously, you know, maybe I was too hasty. Maybe it was the moment. Rethink it. Uh, maybe not. That's the way people are. And if that's the case, you'll be treated not because of that moment, but rather, as they say, proofs in the pudding. Does it hold? Does it not hold? <clears throat> that a person is a devout pagan, even if it becomes a Balchuva, ultimately because he was so involved and immersed in idolatry, ultimately it's going to come back and haunt him. He's going to fall back into his old ways. We're talking about a person who became a Balchuva. Through his own initiative, came certain levels of recognition, and he comes back. But he was a devout pagan. Even that person, because he was so involved and so immersed in it, ultimately, there's a strong likelihood he's going back to where he was. You know what Hashem does? A chesed, he takes him early in his life that he should not go back to that moment. Because since he will go back, and if he goes back, he'll be held culpable, Hashem will not allow him to go back, and Hashem takes his life early. That's by idolatry. So the Gemara speaks the famous Gemara by it. Elizabeth Daduyo, this man, the Gemara tells us in, in Avodah Zorah, 
that there was no prostitute that he never engaged with, ever. And he heard that there's a woman who he had across seven seats who charged an immense, enormous fee for her service, and he didn't engage with her. She takes a purse of gold, travels the seven seas, and finally comes to her. So the Masha over there says, the Torah tells us, with all your heart, with all your, your soul, with all your money. This man was committed to satisfy his desire. He had to engage with this woman. He was willing to put his life in jeopardy, cross seven seas to go with her. And he was willing to be a, a fee, which is an enormous fee. So this person, rather than he invested in himself to be able to satisfy this desire. What happens? He arrives there. He had to climb up a few stories to get into bed with this woman. He gets in bed with this woman and the woman passes air. This is the Gemara. You know what the woman says to him? He says, as this air, as it's left my body, it has no value, your value is worth, you're worthless. This is what she tells the guy. Could you imagine? The moment he hears that, he has immediately pangs and stirrings of tshuva. He runs like the devil from there and he becomes, becomes about tshuva. And he goes and he realizes the word darduya means the dregs of a bar barrel. His name was Elozer ben Darduyo. And he put his feet between his knees and he started to cry. And he started to sob. And he says, heaven and earth, where do I, how could I be forgiven for all that I did? And he goes and he cries his heart out until he expires. And he does tshuva. And he died in a state of tshuva. So as he dies in a state of tshuva, the Abbasco comes out and so it says, Reblezeh ben Darduyo, Yeshlochev Rumabo. Reblezeh, the son of Darduyo, he has a share in the, in the world to come. So it's explained, Eliezer ben Darduyo, Eliezer. God helped this man. Although he's in the dregs, before he was El Eliezer ben Darduyo, Eliezer ben Darduyo. The Basco said, Reb Eliezer. He added the word Reb. The appellation Reb was added to him. You have a share in the world to come. So the says, well, you don't know he had heard what happened. It says he cried. Because here we see, Yesh Koda A person can acquire a share in the world to come in a moment. Here the man was immersed in this kind of behavior, which he had no chance to have any relevance to God. But because of the tshuva, in a moment, he was reinstated to merit even a Basko should come out and say, he has a share in the world to come. So it says he cried, Bocha Rebbe. He says, You see from here, Odom Koydesha Olamo Bshachas. First, can acquire a share in the world to come in, in a moment. So the Marshal explains the Gemara over there. If in one moment he's able to acquire a share in the world to come, why did he cry? He should have been ecstatic. Hashem gave him a gift. What's he crying? So Marshal says, If a person can acquire a, world, a share in the world to come in a moment, so if you invest your whole life in doing the will of Hashem, you can imagine what you acquire. If in a moment, look what you're able to accomplish. So if multiple moments you invested in your life, how much more would have you accomplished? That's what Rebbe cried. It's like a shame. This reveals the value of a person's life. That a moment, look what he's able to accomplish. So if you do it multiple times, your whole life, you can imagine what you're able to accomplish. That's the Marsho. But it says, if he became a Balchuva, why did he die? Hashem should let him live, just the opposite. So the Mara says, because a person is, is so addicted to that kind of behavior, it's not going to last. An addiction, a person goes back. And because Hashem wanted him to retain the Balchuva status, therefore he took his life. As a chesed, so the same thing with a pagan. Even a pagan comes to a, le a level of realization of truth, and he becomes a Balchuva. But since he was so immersed in that type of belief, it's embedded. It touches his heart. He's going back there. Therefore, a chesed, Hashem takes him before he goes back there. But a person is in, in, in the foxhole. And it's a moment. It's only because of the circumstance. The bombs are falling. 
See, there he came to a realization himself. With the fox soul, it's a whole different thing. If he reverts back, he reverted back. That's how I'm differentiating between the two situations. Go to the doctor. He gets a call from the doctor's office three days later. Mr. Schwartz, he's come to the office. The doctor wants to see you. He realizes he may have a problem. The doctor takes out his x-ray, puts it on the, the light, on the wall. He shows him. He says, I want to explain you something. Although you're only 45 years old, you have, you have six weeks to live. I advise you that you should put together all your, your affairs because in six weeks, you're not going to be here any longer. He's devastated. He hasn't been in shul since he's 15 years old, this man. Next morning, the rabbi opens the shuls at six in the morning. He's already waiting at the door at 5.30 in the morning to go to shul. And he has his tefillin in his hand. He hasn't been on tefillin in years. And the rabbi sees this person, looks familiar. And he's sobbing. And he says to the rabbi, he tells the rabbi the story. He says, Rabbi, from now till the day I die, you're going to see him in the shul. Comes to davening every day. He carries on. And he's crying and wailing. He's, he's disturbing the service. People don't know what's going on. They, they explain. He has six weeks to live. He's doing tshuva. And he's crying his heart out. And he's praying like nobody ever prayed. It's like Yom Kippur every day. And all of a sudden, six, three weeks later, he gets a call from the doctor. Goes down, he thinks maybe it's even worse. They said, We made a mistake. It wasn't your x ray, but somebody else's x ray. You never saw the guy again. And that's the way it is. If it's me, it's a problem. Not me, I'm out of here. But it could have been you. Uh, by the, the doctor's version, it's a sabbatical year. What is the whole concept of Shabbos? We find whenever the Torah speaks about Shabbos, it's Shabbos Lashem. Shabbos is for God. What does it mean, Shabbos Lashem? We mentioned, name of Meir Simcha, that Shabbos, all 39 categories of creative activity are not permitted. Even Ochel Nefesh, even something which is food related, is not permitted on Shabbos. Yom Tif, on the festivals, even Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, although there's no mitzvah, not Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, it's not, there's no mitzvah, Samach Tebechagecho, to rejoice, nevertheless, Ochel Nefesh, food-related activities are permitted. On Yom Tif, Yom Kippur is identical, identically to Shabbos, doesn't have the same liability. Shabbos, if one violates the Shabbos, it carries the liability of the death penalty. If one violates Yom Kippur, it's only Kharis spiritual excision. But the provisions are identical, besides the provision to eat. But in terms of malocha, creative activity, it's identically the same. But Yom Tif, Ochel Nefesh, food-related activities are permitted. Shabbos is not. Why? So Rameir Sibla of Dvinsk says, the focus of Shabbos is Bein Odom Lamokum. That's the focus between man and God. Yom Tif is Bein Odom Chavero. So if it's Bein Odom Chavero, a person is permitted to trans, transport from domain to domain. You're permitted to prepare fresh food, baking, cooking, whatever it may be, uh, within a certain context. Reaping is not permitted, but from kneading onward, kneading, cooking, certain things which are foods related, that's permitted. Because that's Bein Odom Chavero. Shabbos is Shabbos Lashem. The focus of Shabbos, the main focus, the main involvement has to be serving Hashem. Address your spirituality. In that context, there's Onik Shabbos. But Yom Tiv, that's the whole discussion, Chatsi Lochem, Chatsi Lashem. There's Hashem, but there's also Lochem. You have to address the Lochem, the person himself. Shemitah, the sabbatical is also, Torah uses the same terminology. The land should remain fallow, and that fallowness, not engaging in agricultural activity, you should designate the year for, for Hashem. That's the, what the year is designated for. And over here, the Sephardim says the same thing. He doesn't say exactly as Rameir Simcha says it, but he says, what is the year, what's, what should it be designated for? 
for meditation, the Torah, and serving Hashem. That's Shabbos, a whole year. You know, six years you're involved continuously in the mundane, in earthly activity. You detach yourself for a year and refocus and reflect on your spirituality, which is avoda. that's Shabbos Lashem. So the Ramchal writes regarding the whole concept of Shabbos that, you know, a person, due to our activities, our, our behavior and what we're exposed to, it affects us very seriously. And this is the famous Chinuch, Odom Nifal Kfi Polosov, that a person's impacted is a product of his behavior, of his actions. So if you're involved six days a week in the mundane and the 39 creative activities, which are all physical, what, what does it do to the person? It actually, it diminishes our spiritual viability and vibrance. So every Shabbos, we reattach. The semblance of Shabbos, Shabbos is a semblance of the world to come. The Kedusha. You enter in that, that state, in that environment, totally removed from physicality in terms of creative activity. Hashem created for six days and refrained on the seventh. We being Dam Hashem and doing that by emulating Him, we are, are beneficiaries of that Kedusha. To attach ourselves to, to the main Olam Abba. That being touched in that to that degree uh, gives us that inner ability and resets our equilibrium, spiritually speaking. And therefore, we're in a position to make choices, to contend with all the challenges of physicality versus spirituality. This is the Ramchal. So there's always cycles, six, seven. Six days of mundane, seventh day is Chodesh Hashem, is Mein Olam Six years of what? Of physical agricultural involvement. The seventh year, sabbatical year. Shabbos Lashem. Again, a detachment, fully immersed in Avodah and the study of Torah to be reconnected. And that reconnection allows us to go for another six years to maintain ourselves. But there's always cycles of six and seven. Able to say Abdullah until through Tuesday. But from Wednesday onwards, you cannot. So the, the Mark tells us why, because the Kedusha of Shabbos, you're still a beneficiary of that Kedusha of the previous Shabbos through Tuesday. That's how it impacts. When you come to Wednesday, Wednesday you're ready within the environment of the upcoming Shabbos. All the days are connected. So you're ready touched by the Kedusha of the upcoming Shabbos. So that's the reason why, because it peters out at the end of Tuesday, the third day. So Abdullah can no longer say because that has come to an end. But through Tuesday, you're still connected to the previous Shabbos. When you come to Wednesday, the fourth day, you're ready within the realm of the Shabbos, so you're ready to touch with the new Shabbos. But the main infusion of Kedusha is the Shabbos itself. Therefore, you always find cycles of six and seven. That's the Ramchal. So I'm saying, we, I always ask the question, we discussed this in Mishpatim, the Allah is, the Torah says that a Jewish slave could only be a slave for six years, no more than six years. What happens if after six years, he says, I love my master, I love my wife, although she's not his wife, because she's a Canaanite slave, and I love my children, although they're not his children. So what does it say? It says, the Bezdin, they, he, right, he gives you El Adel Zuzah, they put a hole through his the cartilage of his right ear. Vavodo Olam, And he remains a slave forever. Right? That's what it says in the Torah. So Rashi says, based on Chazal, Avodo Olam does me forever. It means out of Yovel. When Yovel, the Jubilee, comes, he were free, he's freed. Vishavel Mishpachto, he returns to his family. So the question is, let it say he remains till the Jubilee year. But Torah doesn't say that. Torah says, Avodo Lolom. If you go beyond six years and you get that all through a year, you commit it till the Jubilee, that's called Avod, you're a slave forever. What does that mean? And why through the air? So Rashi cites the Mark of Dushin, 
Ozen Shishoma Bisinai. The ear which heard at Sinai, avodahim, avodim, avodim. You're my subjects, not subjects of subjects. And he sold himself in slavery or he did an act which he deserves to be sold. As a result of that, he, he, he has a certain defect, defect in his mechanism that he would, did not fully internalize and understand what that was. And therefore, he's gone beyond the six years. Therefore, it's avodololam. So based on the Ramchal's concept, to be able to retain our spiritual equilibrium, maximum, you're a slave for six years, it's bad enough. If you go beyond the six, that becomes a permanent, you become permanently handicapped. So even though you're freed with the Jubilee year, but in terms of his spirituality being impaired, after six years, you can never return to that original state. After six years, you return, you're freed, and you retain your persona as not a slave, you could, re, you could actually reestablish yourself. You go beyond six, then already can never. That you, you're permanently damaged, and therefore that's avodah lolo. It's the equivalent like you're a slave forever. That defect remains with you forever. When you have six, seven, you not you don't become that physical person. If you re-spiritualize in the seventh year, seventh day, or in the seventh year, but if you violate the Shabbos and you don't have that re-spiritualization, that reconnection. That you're impacted seriously. The following week is not going to be the same week. Because you can all be a beneficiary of the Shabbos. If it's Shabbos Lashem, that's when you if you're spiritually connected. And to the degree that you are connected, that's the degree that you're impacted by the Shabbos. It was known that the Nitziv, from the told to you the Berlin, although he spoke Yiddish, he was from Lithuania, the Shiva Velozhin, Shabbos, he only spoke Lashem Kodesh. Shabbos, he only spoke Hebrew. Because since Hebrew is Loshna Kodesh and Shabbos is main on the therefore he only spoke Loshna Kodesh and Shabbos. That was the Nitziv. Again, he wanted to be full of, have the full maximum effect and impact of that Shabbos. Question I'll tell you what the time of Kodesh says. Go ahead, ask the question. Before Adam, before Adam sinned, what were those six days? Okay. What were they? Uh, what were they supposed Adam was to? created on the sixth day. Hmm? He was created on the sixth day of creation. Okay. On that few hours after he was created, he entered the tree of knowledge. He sinned. He was driven out of the Garden of Eden. He and his wife, they were driven out, never to be able to return. So the Orachayim, now there's a question, what exactly was the fruit of the tree of knowledge? There's a question what it was. Ramir says it was the grape. Was the grape. Why was it the grape? Because you find that the greatest tragedy to humanity comes through drunkenness. And what represents drunkenness? Wine. As we find by Noah, he became drunk and the whole story evolved with, with Chom and the whole story. By Yishkar. He became, he became, he defiled himself through drinking. So the Zohar says, the Rechaim Kodesh cites the Zohar, that if Odom would have eaten of the grape, there's one according to Rebbeir's position, the Zohar says, he would have taken the grape, squeezed it, and he would have said, Kiddush Friday night on that grape, on that cup of grape juice, or that cup of wine. But because he ate of the grape before he was supposed to eat the grape, he was driven out of God Eden. But initially, that grape represents the ultimate sanctification to acknowledge Hashem as the creator. But because he failed, and he used the grape to go against God, then he was driven out. And he never made it to that, to that point. But if he would have, the world would have reached its level of perfection, and it would have been eternal. Adam would have been eternal, and all humanity, his children, they would all be, been, we'd all be eternal. But because the evil of the Eitz Das became intermingled in existence, this existence cannot be eternal. If it's only 6,000 years, after 6,000 years, it comes to an end. And the 7,000th year, the world is fallow. And the 8,000th year, Hashem will recreate a new existence. And whoever is worthy to be there will be reunited with his body in a whole different dimension of being, which we have no idea what that is, to be able to cleave to Hashem in that physical, spiritual sense, but the physicality, the Ramchal explains, 
will be so will be subsumed by the spirituality of the mitzvahs to function to, totally as a, a spiritual being. Every person merits to be there. So it will be it will be a total Shabbos seven days a week, seven days of Shabbos. It'll be attached to God continuously forever. Hashem spoke to Moshe Bar Sinai, and then we speak about the laws of the sabbatical year. I mean, why the sabbatical year? Why not? I mean, Hashem spoke to Sinai. The Torah was, he spoke to him about a lot of things. I mean, everything's from Sinai. And that's the famous question which Rashi cites Chazal. Parsinai, Mayin Shmita Elit Parsinai. Why does the Torah juxtapose the first thing which, the first mitzvah which the Torah discusses, which has realms in Sinai, is the mitzvah of Shmita? The local mitzvah never be Sinai. Every, all the mitzvahs were given at Sinai. El Mashmita Nemru Kloosel, Protosel, Vatik Tukemi Sinai. Just as the Torah shows us that all the details and the subcategories and all the applications, because it's all fleshed out of this parsha, were said at Sinai. Afkan, Afkulon, Nemru Kolosem Diktem Sinai. Although the Torah doesn't articulate it as such, but this reveals that just as this was, every all aspects were stated at Sinai. All aspects of every mitzvah was given to Moshe at Sinai. What does that mean? When the, in Arvis Moav, we, we recommitted to the new covenant, Shemitah is not mentioned. Why? Because it already was said at Sinai. Therefore, they, it didn't have to be repeated then, that they should hear it fully fleshed out. Although Moshe didn't communicate everything what he had at Sinai at that moment, and it was all communicated at Abras Moav, so we're saying, what was com what was communicated there? What was said at Sinai? Shemi Sinai ho'ekula kolosem dekutkeen v'chazu v'nishnu barvas Moav. And everything was repeated at Avras Moab. Okay. Let's stop here. Continue tomorrow in the Chumash. See, people make a mistake. You know, persons, are you permitted to pick up something? And walk less than Dalai Ramos. You're not permitted. No. Because there's a chance if you walk less, you may walk the full, the full Dalai Ramos. So the same thing, any situation where there's a moment where a person may have a lapse of cognizance at the moment, and you may go beyond that you, what you're permitted to go, we don't even allow you to start. So to pick up something, I mean, you want to stop in the street and you want to adjust your glasses, but take them off and just clean them. You know, a Blow off whatever whatever is blocking, which which is blocking your vision. It's not a problem. Or you want to fix your talus and in a way, and you stop and you don't walk. The moment you do it while you're walking, it's a problem. Because when you're walking, what happens if you walk a little bit too far? It becomes a problem. So if you're stationary, it's not a problem. But if you do it as you're walking, that, that's a problem. Okay, let's see the Shari Chuba. So the, if a woman wants to show her friend her jewelry, but she doesn't take it off, she shows it to her and she stops. She, and takes, that, it, she takes it off or she doesn't take it off? She doesn't take it off, it's not a problem because she's wearing it. No, but I'm saying the same thing. If she actually you know, stops. Those days, when you would take it off, it was inevitable. They started to walk. They would start talking, engaging conversation. It's not you taking it off for yourself. There's nobody taking it off. Okay, we left off page one three fifty four. Ish ish el kosher b'sar lo sikvu. A person's not permitted to do it, engage with someone who sexually is forbidden to him. The opposite sex, which is forbidden to you, you cannot. 
come close. We're talking about active intimacy. Kokirim bosa osur. Flesh touching flesh is not permitted. We're talking about a Torah violation. You touch another woman's not your wife. She's a married woman. And you come in contact with her. What we'll talk about. Because ultimately it could lead to what? To the provision of not cohabiting with the woman. This is one of the only rabbinic Torah fences. Normally fences are rabbinical. This is a Torah offense. Because it may lead to that, that's a, this is a Torah offense. That that you come in contact with another person's flesh, the woman, not a married woman, that act of intimacy, touching. So let's talk. You're in this, you go to the store and you buy something, and the woman at the cash register, she puts money in your hand and she touches your hand. Is that a provision? It's not a provision. Because that contact is not called derechibo. It's not in the context, it's showing any affection. It's not an affectional, you know, it's not with the context, it's affection. Therefore, she touches, it's not, it, there's nothing wrong with it. Unless a person, certain people are affected by many things. She's the, the, the checkout girl, she's attractive. And when she touches him, he, he's touched him in a certain way. It's a problem. But if it's just a mundane, just an ordinary act, when she puts the change in here, it means nothing. There's no provision. A person could, could create a self-imposed fence. You know, it's only when she puts bills in my hand, I'll take it. But if she's put the money directly in my hand, that, that's a personal fence. But it's not necessary. Unless you are affected. Certain people are affected by certain things. So then you should. You know, this checkout girl always, you see her, she touches in a certain way. So if you physically, she touches you, you may be affected by it. Therefore, you have to keep your distance. You have to just deal with your own reality. But this is one of the Torah fences that it's, although it's a fence, it's a Torah fence. There's an argument among Rishonim. There's a locha that a, a Kohen, a Kohen Godel, Kohen Godel is not permitted to contaminate himself, even we just had last week's parsha, even the seven closest relatives. It says, lo He should not leave the Migdosh. He should not put himself in a position where he, he may become contaminated because a, a Kohen Godel, even when he's an Onein, he's permitted to officiate. He's permitted to officiate. So as a result of that, he should not put himself in a position where he may, his kuna may be violated, becoming Tomei contaminated. Therefore, min amigdash lo yetzei. So the Gemara says that according to Rabbi Yehuda, let's say he's following the, in the funeral procession. He should not be in the same line he could be a thousand feet away. Of course, if he's visually he's able to see the body, there's a chance you may come in contact with the body. So that goes into the Omin Amigdash Lo He should not put himself in a situation where he'll violate his status that he won't be able to officiate. So the Mar and the Mar says he's only permitted to follow the funeral procession that when they turn a corner, he's on the other. He doesn't see it. Visually, he's not. He's, he's, he's following, but not visually, he doesn't see so this machlok shishonim, that interpretation, that posuk, is that an asmachto? Is that a rabbinic interpretation? Or that is a doraisa? Just as it says here, kol sheb ser lo sikla galo serva. You're not permitted to do to do anything which has realms to intimacy regarding a woman that's not permitted to you. Identically that, the Torah is creating a, a Torah fence so the Kohen God should not violate his guna. But this is not a question. In Shulchan Aruch and Hilchus Nida, it speaks about a person's a doctor. And he has to take the pulse of a woman. And a doctor has to touch a woman. When he touches her, it's not, it's not an act, considered an act of intimacy, regardless. Of course, but let's say the doctor is the type of person. Today you hear all kinds of stories about doctors. right? And the doctor is affected. He's affected. When he examines female patients, he's affected by it. Therefore, when he touches the woman, it touches him a certain way. It, it, it's, it's a problem. It's a problem for that doctor. 
The Gemara says in Bav Metzia that you're not permitted, if you see two animals engaged in an act of procreation, you're not permitted to visually look at it. Why? Because it could actually bring certain thoughts to a person's mind, so therefore you should not look at it. When two animals are engaged in procreation, it's more so, so a farmer who inseminates uh, what the female calf, and she takes the organ of the bull and puts it into the cow, he's engaging in it. So it says, told. When the farmer is doing it, it's just doing a, a mundane act. It's not within that context because that's that's his that's his responsibility to inseminate the female. And if the bull doesn't, he could actually insert the male organ of the bull to inseminate the 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 female, the cow. But if it's in the context where it's not that where it's not seen as that state of prof professionalism as a farmer or as a doctor, then it's a problem. Let's see the Gemara. So if you're in a, a meeting, a business meeting, and a woman extends her hand. Let's the, leave it for tomorrow. I don't want to. Yeah, right. Tomorrow. And I'll just add some. It's much for tomorrow. Okay, fine. Tomorrow. Okay, fine. Okay. The Mishnah ended off on Kobezum at Bays that a person uses within his terminology of setting up the contract, he uses terms which seem to be contradictory. And we're not exactly sure what he meant. And the example in the Mishnah was a person says, I'm renting you this residence 12 coins for the year. Then he says, one gold coin per month. So what did he mean? And all of a sudden now you have a leap year. So what do you do? He said 12 coins for the year. And at the end, he concludes coin per month. So does he have to pay 13 coins for the extra month? Or no, he's only explaining it means it's 12 coins for the year. And how are we breaking it down? The calculation, it's coin per month. So does the landlord, does he have a right to take an extra coin for that 13th month? Well, no, he doesn't. And the tenant has a right to be in the residence without paying that extra coin. So the, the Mishnah says it came, the Shaila came before Rabbi Gamaliel and Rabbi Yossi, they ruled, they ruled Yach Loku. Since it's something which can't be resolved, they split it. That the landlord has a right to be paid for half a month and the tenant has a for half a month residency without paying. Okay, so Rav, we're holding the Gemara. Rav said, it's after the mission about eight lines down, on Kofbeis on the base, Omar Rav, Iavoi Hoso, Havi Hivinale Kule Lamaskia. He says, if I would have been there to rule on this case, I would have said that the, the landlord has the full right to the full payment for that 13th month. I would have disagreed. It's not, you know, since it's not resolved, you, you divide the month. I would have been there. The landlord has the upper hand and he has a right full payment for the 13th month. My Kamash Malon, what is Rav telling us? Tovis Loshan Achron. That when a person makes this kind of statement, it's always the concluding statement is what he means. It's 12 coins per year, a coin, one gold coin per month. That's what it's all about. You're paying per month. So if that was the conclusion, gold coin per month, so if there's a 13th month, you pay that for, you pay for the month. So that's toughest Lashon Afro. The we go after we give greater, we go to the give value to the concluding statement, which is a coin per month. So when he said 12 for the month, he only meant that is that is what it costs you a, a normal year. But if it should be a leap year. You're going to pay a coin per month, so you're going to pay that extra coin to the landlord. 
So the landlord has the upper hand. That's what Rav says. So the Mar asks, Ha'omer Rav Chaduzimno? Rav already had stated this, that we always go after the, the concluding statement. Domer Rav Huna, Omer Amri Dvei Rav. Rav Huna, who was a Talmud of Rav, had said, <coughs> we learned in the base venture of Rav, Istiro Meyamoi. And Istiro is a coin which has 96 pennies in it. It's worth 96 copper coins. But he concludes, Meyamoi, 100, 100 coins. So what did he mean? Did he mean Istiro, which means 96, but he concluded, Meyamoi, 100. Or he said, Meyamoi, 100 coins. So then he pays Meyamoi. When he said Meyamoi, Istiro, first he said Meyamoi, and then he said Istiro. He said something seemed to be 100. Then he says, he concludes, 96, Istiro, you pay Istiro. You pay the lesser amount. So whatever amount you conclude with, that's what the man means. That's the concept of Tov Slash and Afro. Samar asks, Imi Hosom, so why does Rav have to repeat it twice? He says, if I would have been there, I would have disagreed with the ruling of the Mishnah. Because I hold Tov Slash and Afro. You always go after the concluding statement. That's what he means. But Rav already said it elsewhere. Says Imi Hosom, Hava Min Prushikam Farish. If I would have been, if we'd only have that statement about Estiro normally means 96, but sometimes Estiro, the coin, could mean 100. See, over there, he's only explaining what he meant. What he meant was the coin which is worth 100 copper coins. Hava Min Prushikam Farish. Kamash Malon, no. That the closing statement is not. To explain what he meant, but rather that's the intent. 12 we mean like this. It costs you 12 coins for the year. That's an ordinary year. The 13th year, if it should be a leap, but in reality, you're paying per month. You're paying a coin per month. Shmuel disagrees. Shmuel disagrees. What does it mean? If there's a question... We don't say toughest lashon afro. It's not the concluding statement. So, but Mishnah says yach loko. It seems to be in the Mishnah. The way Rav understands the Mishnah comes to the beginning of the thirteenth month. The landlord says, "I want you out unless you pay me for the month." The tenant says, but the, the lease says, twelve coins for the year, and I pay twelve. Years. So that includes the thirteenth month. So the Mishnah says yach loko. So when is this 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 agreement between the landlord and the tenant? It's either at the beginning of the month or at the end of the month. But since it's a resolvable, the mission says Yach Loko. Rob says, if I would have been there, I wouldn't have said Yach Loko. I wouldn't say they divide the month. The landlord only has a right to charge at the beginning of the month for half a month. And if it's the end of the month, the tenant has to pay the landlord half a month's rent. So it's irrelevant whether you're in the middle of the month, the beginning of the month, the end of the month. According to Rob, if not for toughest lotion Achron, if not for the concluding statement having that value, you divide the month regardless when you come into the picture. Shmuel says, no. The Mishnah of Yachloku has nothing with Sumchis. We're speaking about it's the middle of the month. It comes two weeks into the month and the landlord says to the tenant, What's, what are you doing here? You know, I want to be paid for the, for the month. The tenant says, I'm not paying you because according to the way I understand the lease, I have a right to be here. The landlord has a right to dispossess him for the balance of the month unless he pays him for the month. Okay? What about he's demanding payment for the beginning of the month? Does not pay for the beginning of the month. But if it would be at the beginning or the end of the month, the beginning of the month, the landlord could dispossess him totally unless he pays. The end of the month where the tenant lived there the landlord ha cannot take money from the tenant. Why? Because we have a principle. If if I have a, my financial claim to you and I can't prove the claim beyond any doubt, the burden of proof is on the one who wants to extract money from the other person. So if the tenant already had lived the 13th month, now the landlord's coming to collect rent for the 13th month, the tenant could withhold rent saying, based on my understanding of the contract, I only have paid 12 for the year and you can't prove 
that I owe you for the 13th month. And if the landlord can't prove that, he can't take anything from the tenant. And what be if it's the beginning of the 13th month? Who's the music in the karka? And whose possession is the is 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 the is the property? It's in the it's in the, in the possession of the owner of the landlord. He says, if you can't prove that you have a right to be here, you're out, and therefore you can remove him from the property. So Shmuel says, it's speaking, this whole dispute came up. He showed up in the middle of the month. The landlord, Shmuel Omar bebobem zechodesh askino. That's the achloku. Avol bobet chilas chodesh. But let's say the land would come at, come at the beginning of the 13th month. Kuli Lamaskir. The month, the maskir, the landlord has a right to dispossess the tenant unless he pays. Because whenever you have a sovi, we say, you go after the muzik. Who owns the property? The landlord. So if you can't prove that you have a right to be here, I have a right to take you off the property. What about if the landlord shows up after the 13th month is completed? And now he's coming to demand rent for the 13th month. Cool of the Shomer. The Shomer, the Lesoche, the renter has a right to retain the money. Why? You want, you claim I owe you. If you prove to me that you, I owe you beyond any doubt, then you have a right to extract the money from me. But until you bring that level of proof, I have to give you nothing. Okay? So Shmuel doesn't agree with Rav, the toughest lotion achro. We don't go after the concluding statement, because going to Rav, even if he comes at the beginning of the month, the landlord wants to dispossess him, he can't, because you always go after the, excuse me, the last statement is a coin per month. The landlord has a right to claim the 13th month, even at the end of the 13th month, according to Rav. Was tough as Lashon Achron. Was the c- concluding statement, that's, that's what I meant. 12 months, is 12 coins, that's an ordinary year. But it's coin per month. So if there's a 13th month, the, the tenant has to pay the landlord for the, for the month that extra coin. Okay? Remember, remember the, the rub is still recorded. I don't know if you want it to record. I don't. <laughs>